called uh, visualizing mobile structures. Okay. Um, yeah. First, uh, let me start with a uh, map uh, for you guys to see uh, of a uh, a city. In fact, this is a uh, Boston uh, in Massachusetts, United States. Uh, so where I did some spend my time in the U.S. So this map shows a aerial view of the city. So a structure of the city then you can see how complicated it is. There's a lot of buildings and tiny, tiny organized buildings. And you can see some. And I want to share with the uh, another uh, picture uh, overlaid on this, which is uh, this. This is about uh, like a big data challenge, uh, visualizing 4 million taxi rides. So this slide, uh, represents a taxi ride place uh, 4 million data. So this is a big data challenge coming and you can start to see kind of which part are most of taxi rides are there. This means that there are more people who are taking taxi cab transportation. So this really shows uh, one of the structure versus the other, some kind of an activity. So this analogy I hope to uh, convey you for this week and next week's uh, visualization of neural structure and function. All right, so what's our goal? So we want to study process of neural tissue for histological procedures. So these are like some part is common with a uh, conventional biology, but we are more specific into our uh, neuronal structure. So we will talk about methods for visualizing gross cellular morphology, the methods for visualizing the gene and protein expression, and also uh, methods for visualization neural circuitry and connections between different brain regions. Right. So the technique wise, we will be talking about uh, tissue preparation, fixation, embedding and section. And second, uh, visualizing a neural structure, which we use a fundamental histological method, uh, such as basophilic stains, uh, which is stainable with a basic dyes and fiber stain. And you, you heard already G stain, and intracellular and cellular region. And this Wednesday, we'll talk, be talking about gene and protein expression and visualizing uh, circuitry. Okay. So let's get started with the uh, tiling. So why are we doing this? By examining the, I think these are now very easy for you guys. The structure of an object, um, its potential function could be tracked from an expected hypothesis. One good example is a the father of modern neuroscience, who are Santiago Ramon y Cajal in Spain. He formed many new hypotheses about the function of the neural system. So you guys remember his beautiful pictures out of his uh, limited uh, uh, microscope examination, he actually formed hypothesis neuron doctoring, which is an individual neuron form this circuitry. While it's very hard to see the synapse at the time, but yet by watching carefully the structure, one can like, think of the function. Another good example in modern biology history is the, um, the DNA structure discovery um, by Watson and Crick. So the central question about how heredity occurs, that secret of life was in fact uh, expedited to understand by, a, by making a guess and model of DNA structure. The structure contains already the answer of how we can have a genetic uh, transmission 
of how copy mechanism of gene from the upper to lower generation. So that's our rationale. And we talk about cells uh, has different structure and functional groups expressing unique combination of genes and protein. We all know that in one organism, all the cells have the same gene, genetic makeup. However, the expression of gene and protein check, uh, makes whole like over 200 different kinds of cell types inside our body. And the other aspect is about the uh, connections, big white matter track. We all know white matter is white because of the myelin seed, which scatters light a lot. So that's why it looks white. And that white matter represents axonal tracks. And we can have an analogy for that as a like here, highway, you see a tiny, tiny cars are passing fast. So it's a long distance site of neural communication. On the other hand, we all know that there are highways, but when you get into uh, down to a town, then you can have a collector and local roads. So this local roads are small fiber track, which tells us about local communication networks between populations of neurons. Okay, to survey uh, the technique to investigate the structure and connectivity of the nervous system, we want to classify cells based on location, morphology, gene protein expression, profile, and connections with other cells. So then uh, there is a question we have to prepare the cell, uh, the cell and tissue. However, you guys now experience to you watch uh, the brain of a, a mouse or rat. So this neural tissue is very, very soft and delicate and it's easily degradable. So that's why once you know, the tissue is taken out. Uh, it's very soft. It's just quick to degrade. So you gotta be very, very fast and make sure you preserve the neural tissue. So how to keep this tissue as close to its living state as possible? By reuse process tissue by fixing, embedding, and sectioning before proceeding with a visualization method. And fixing and embedding means we stabilize the tissue to capture its current state. And sectioning makes the tissue thin enough for light to pass through for microscopic examination of the internal structure. Okay, so sorry I added in two new slides because uh, this might help you to understand. So the, the two slide of uh, reference is here. So I want to show that uh, the, the, the procedure, how things occur. So let's assume we take out the brain, it's a fresh. Soon we have to section this tissue. So the first path is the left path. So we put tissue into OCT stands for optimal cutting temperature. It's like a jelly, like ultrasound jelly-like structure, but once you put it in a cold, it will form like a whitish uh, ice, okay? So we freeze this uh, tissue by use of liquid nitrogen and dry ice. And so we create tissue block. Now you see the brain is embedded in, in uh, this OCT so that, so that we can actually start to cut. And then we cut it in this cold environment. That's why we have to do it inside the freezer. So we call it that as a cryo step. Okay, and then what are we gonna do with this? We will be using it a quick HNE stain. Let's assume we are, we are a neurosurgeon. We take out tissue from the brain of a patient who have a, a tumor. We want to find out the tumor margin and we have to do it quick. So that's why we use it this way, quick HNE stain or IHC, immunohistochemistry or LCM stands for laser capture microdissection. LES, I did, I just found it. I actually do not have any idea of this. So this is one way. And the other time we have to consider is now we have more time for fixation 
and tissue processing by dehydration of tissue and infiltration in lungs. So this is path is called a uh, paraffin embedding. So this is more uh, traditional when we have time. Um, and if we don't need a fresh uh, protein, uh, DNA, RNA and all, so we embed in what? And this is hot. So we have to lose some of the other stuff, uh, but we can make a very hard, you know, the candle that wax has providing excellent uh, stability for tissue block so that we can cut sections on microtome. And then after section, we can de wax and we can also do HME stain. In fact, this is a more traditional way of HME stain because compared to this ice form versus this, this provides way better quality HME stain. And immunohistochemistry and the same. Okay, so similar, but I want to give you another aspect of this whole process. So we've got this tissue section. I talk about fixation of the tissue and we can put it into a vibratome to cut this section. So this is when we do brain slice, we use this vibratome uh, because brain slice, we have to keep the cells uh, tissue alive. The other way is a cryopathy protector. Because when, when you guys, you are not supposed to freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw your meat many times because it will be degrading the, uh, the food. Likewise, we have, when we freeze, we have to protect the cryo and then you freeze. And using this freezing microphone or using cryostat, you can have a section and some of this can go to like this grid. This is more like an electron microscope plate. And cryostat, we can have a typical cryo section. Uh, these are frozen, uh, free to frozen uh, sample. The other way is the right hand side of the previous slide. So it's a paraffin or resin. Resin is like plastic. This is more for like even tough, harder uh, shell for electron microscope, right? So typical paraffin block, you can also use micro pump to cut sections, which is, you see, a little bit thinner because the paraffin is more uh, sturdy. So paraffin blocks, you can make even thinner section. So the typical HME stain uses about five micron things, very, very thin. Think about the size of the cell, usually about cell body 10 micron uh, diameter. So this really can make a single cell layer uh, of uh, histology slide. And the other is electron microscope that we call ultra microtome and put it grid and you can see the section thickness of the even tens of nanometer. And I hope this won't give you an overview. Okay, so let's go back step by step about tissue fixation. You have brain, what are you gonna do? It's you put even after perfusion fixation, which I will be talking about, you put it in 4% para from aldehyde, which is written here with the volume. For two, 12 hours means it's overnight. So you do experiment, you go back to home the next day morning. What you're gonna do is you actually soak it into 30% sucrose. Yeah, this is sugar, okay? Sucrose solution, even sometimes twice. Why are we gonna do this? Because for freezing, um, the structure uh, can easily form crystallize and break. And so, by, to prevent that, we use sucrose uh, uh, immersion. All right. So, how to? What's the role of fixation? The process of using chemical method to preserve, stabilize, and strengthen a biological specimen for subsequent um, zooing. Can you guess what this is? Uh, hypo yes, histological, exactly. Oh, yes. Procedure and microscopic analysis. Uh, preservation of cells and tissues by strengthening molecular interactions, disabling endogenous proteo, this is a little difficult to read, enzymes and killing microorganisms. So think about, you take out the brain, there's a potential like, um, uh, bacteria, it's contamination. And 
You know what happens? When we take out the tissue, right away, we stop circulating perfusion of nutrient. The cell starts to be undergoing in a uh, ischemic condition. So what, what, are, what are they do? They're still alive. They will start to undergo apoptosis because it's a dying condition. What that means is they will have a pro, uh, they have enzymes to cut, chop, chop, chop all their internal protein. Okay. But with, we don't want that. Okay. So that's why timing is important. And also we want to fix them before it happens. Okay. So disabling endogenous protein. Julie, can you guess? Disintegration of the Yes, cratiolytic enzyme. Okay. And if there's any any like bugs or bacteria, we have to kill those microorganisms. So this fixation terminates any ongoing biochemical reactions by fixing okay? proteins into plate because we don't want the protein to change. A process that kills cells that are already not already there. So this is we call fixation. Okay. And you know that already happens here. Okay, now, so what are we using for this? What chemical fixatives are we using? So two different aspects. One is cross-linking fixatives. So we want to hold the internal structures down. That's one. The other is the cells also contain a big portion was water and we want to dehydrate it. Uh, so replacing the water. So for first cross-linking, for light microscopy, uh, creates Jo ji -hun, create yeah. chemical bond between um, ji -hun. Yeah. Yes, what yeah. kind of chemical bond? Covalent. Excellent. Yeah, you know, we want to make a covalent bonding. That's like chemical bonding, the strong one, right? including organic compounds with L, D groups, such as formaldehyde, paraformaldehyde, and glutaraldehyde. Jihun, can you guess what this? Uh, aldehyde. Great, yes. So this formaldehyde actually does cross-linking of the proteins so that it grabs and uh, hardly fix uh, making bonds. And especially for typical ones are probably different from when you are working on electron microscope, the requirement is also different because the electron microscope cuts tens of nanometers. You know, the harder the fixative, you can actually cut even sharper. Okay, so electron, we are not gonna use the same one as this, but we're gonna use osmium tetroxide, which causes a molecule to, uh, I'll tell you, oxidize. And if you often use as a fixative for electron microscope, the color is super dark, okay? But it's like a plastic resin. So it, it's very hard so that you can cut very fine um, uh, 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 sections. And the other aspect is dehydrating fixative. Okay, we have to disrupt lipids and reduce solubility of protein molecule and precipitate them out of cytoplasmic and extracellular solutions. Uh, this is being used in high uh, alcohol kind, such as methanol and acetone. So this is dehydrating fixative. You remember sometimes we put small embryos into uh, methanol, okay, or acetone. You can preserve the tissue for a long time. Okay. So um, I hope some of you have done some know, but I want to go over emergent fixation versus perfusion fixation. So you take out the brain, okay? Then you will uh, put in into, let's say, uh, PFA, paraformaldehyde for percent. So you put the, your tissue there. This is called emergent fixation. The practical aspects of this is, you know, the brain, mouse brain is so thick that by just based on diffusion, it's hard to get in. During the time inside the brain tissue, there may be already proteolytic uh, process going and tissue can be degrading. We don't want that, okay? So another 
very efficient way is actually called cohesion fixation. The idea is we use the same way our cells and tissues are being provided by oxygen and, and nutrients. We use the same route, instead we give formaldehyde instead of blood. So how we do that? Based on our knowledge of cardiovascular system, you look at this uh, mouse uh, heart, you see left ventricle, the pump of the body, and the drain is a right atrium because this is where all the venous drainage is are gathering. So we cut this and then we start to inject into left ventricle our perfusion, which is formaldehyde. Then while the heart is beating, you know what heart is pumping? They pumps in a uh, fixative such as parfumide. So this is the most efficient way because from the bottom uh, downstream, we are providing this fixative to all the cells throughout the body. So look at this. So this requires a technique perfusion needle in the left ventricle then you see Paris start to pump, mimicking the function of the heart uh, perfusion. And we have fixative solution. Sometimes we inject the saline first to remove red blood cells, blood cells inside the body. And then by using this, we actually perfuse throughout the body, not from the surface of the organ, from the inside of the organ. Because emergent fixation is so, uh, from the surface. So sometimes we have problem. So that's why sometimes we cut the brain into pieces when we do this emergent fixation, depending on what our purpose is. All right, so let's go uh, to a little bit more detail. Emergent fixation is we put small brains or even entire animals in fixative solution. Then the time issue, the time for fixative to penetrate the entire tissue by um, using what? Can you guess what? By a D? Depending. <coughs> yes, diffusion. Yes. Depends on the size of the tissue. So you have to know the basic scales of this. For example, fry brain so tiny, even less than a millimeter, then you can it can take a few minutes. Is good. What about mouse brain, which is scale of several millimeter? Wow, it can take days. You have to understand this. But if you cut this brain into let's say like two three millimeter size or brain size, you know it can take just several hours. Okay. On the other hand, perfusion fixation we deliver a fixative through animals. Uh, smell again. Okay. Cardiovascular. Exactly, yeah. Cardio. The animal's heart, we are using it. After anesthesia, but the process, uh, yeah, I hope you can practice this uh, later. Carefully open the rib cage to expose the heart. And then we penetrate left ventricle with a needle connected to a perfusion film. This requires a little technique because it's a delicate. Uh, then, thorough, quick, and adequately, we can fix all the cells throughout the body, including the brain. And so, for example, for a mouse case, uh, it can take five to 15 minutes. For red brain, it's a little bigger. To make it really thorough, it can take more time. So the time depends. But the point is, perfusion fixation is a widely used technique, and it just effectively fixes from the you know, capillary level of tissue. All right, each histological method determines whether fixa which fixation is necessary, whether fixation is necessary or not, or which fixative to use, and when the fixation should occur. Okay. Okay, for, um, for example, when we use a fixative, we use like a uh, cross-linker, so people who are who needs a uh, fresh DNA and RNA, sometimes we have to see this fixation is necessary or not, we have to decide. So uh, first I want to show tissue embedding, sorry about the poor quality, but I want to point out that this is a, um, uh, a metal, sometimes we use a plastic, uh, uh, this uh, pocket, 
And you see the tissues are actually uh, uh, standing up. How can you make it? Sometimes uh, you have to make the brain uh, like uh, brain corona section. What you have to do is you have to put the brain like this. It's hard. So how you do it? You use a liquid nitrogen bottom and brain will be just uh, frozen at the bottom. And then you pour OCT embedding, then you can make this orientation and you can have a nice cup. So this is an example. You see the tissues are vertical and then you pour OCT to keep the orientation and then you freeze it. Then it becomes this whitish ice block. So then you can, can put it into the um, a cassette. So that's called OCT or, or optimal cutting temperature. So this is called embedding process of surrounding a brain or tissue of interest within a substance that infiltrates and form part of shell around of the tissue. So this embedding stabilizes the tissue structure and make it easier to cut. Okay. So standard embedding is like gelatin, paraffin wax, and plastic. Okay such as some resin. And here I already told you about OCT. This OCT is a wider use for a frozen section. So this contains water-soluble glycolate. All right, so for tissue sectioning, you have to have uh, the orientation. So we already talked about this coronal section of the brain. You can see a, a distinct um, hippocampus structure here. And the sagittal plane, you can see the whole section of sagittal or sometimes horizontal section. Okay. So process of cutting brain into thin slice is necessary to examine structural neurons within the brain. So this is a traditional because the brain is big in terms of microscopic view. So we have a cut, then we, we can only see that part. But since 2013, things have changed because the big problem of the observation by optical method is the scattering of the tissue. That's why our tissue look opaque, not transparent. Now, actually a Korean scientist, uh, Professor Hong Hyun Jung, uh, now at MIT creates a, a method for transparent the tissue called clarity technology. So this actually revolutionizes some of this and it's still ongoing, especially until into the clinic or pathology. So sectioning the brain allowed histological reagents access to cells within the slice and examination with a microscope. I have to say, if we have exogenous, uh, let's say dyes to stain neurons or myelin, we still have to consider like this section is very effective because once you have section, you can just easily predict a staining reagent sometimes. But the whole brain, uh, unless it comes from the beginning, it's hard to get diffused, uh, such as an antibody or fixative uh, or dyes inside the tissue. That's always a problem. So there are a number of tissue sectioning devices, which uh, actually can be confusing at first. I want to go uh, one by one with it. So the, they look like this. Okay. Unless you see the actual machine, it may be not easy, but I'm going to tell you about uh, this. So first, microtome. Microtome literally means, tome is cut. Micro means, you know, you can cut micros, micrometer scale, okay? So especially for brain, in this case, I have to say this part is actually calcium cooler. So it makes the tissue super cool. Or you could use sometimes dry ice. So brains are frozen here. And then you see this long one, this is a, a, a blade. So it goes like slice. So it's called deli machine. I don't know, when you go to a deli market, they slice hams and sausages, okay? So, and that preserves tissue. And this is uh, about 20 uh, tens of my conception. Now you move this one, instead of X, uh, like in room temperature, Sometimes you want to put this uh, microphone inside a refrigerator, uh, not refrigerator, but freezer, okay? So that's called cryostat because a cryo is a freezing, okay? Range are frozen and inside this 
chamber is now you can keep it minus 20 to minus 30 very very cold which means OCT compound there are will be already frozen things are frozen inside okay so sections can be cut in a cold chamber and you can cut even thin sections inside okay because it's all frozen right and the last one which um is called a vibratome. So literally what it means is cut, but by using vibration. How does it cut? You have a blade, you know, razor blade. When we cut something, it's best to cut, like when you're cooking, okay? So this vibration uh, makes the machine called a vibratome. Uh, the important part of this is, instead of this freezing, this one, don't need to be frozen the, because it's a vibrating. So it's a, like fresh tissue, like grains just right out of the body, you can cut with a fiber pump. Why? For example, brain slice experiment. You want to keep the cells and tissue alive, not frozen to death, okay? So this is a, by itself a great way, but you know, cut this uh, mushy brain is very hard. So that's why you see thickness is not that thick, thin. So it's uh, like hundreds of microns. Okay, so let me talk about a microphone. So you see the block of tissue. It looks like this when you use this uh, circular lever to move the, the blade up and down to use microphone blade to cut the tissue and then you can put it into this light. So it has a retractable blade. And sometimes uh, this one is a, in fact a paraffin block, okay? But as I said, sometimes we use a freezing microtom to for a frozen tissue. So um, uh, you can think of frozen tissue as uh, think about a surgical environment. You, have, you want to take out the tissue from let's say uh, brain surgery take out tissue, you want to check whether this is a malignant tumor or benign tumor, you need to see within a quick HME. You don't have time for all this like time consuming uh, fixation so that you just free and then send it to a pathology room. They do this uh, frozen section cut. So, but the tissue must be cryoprotected by soaking in a, I already said, sucrose solution to minimize artifacts caused by freezing uh, surgical place will not have time for this, by the way. They will just do it because it's, you know, quality is not what matters in that case. Okay. But otherwise, we soak in sucrose overnight, several days, sometimes, so that we can collect these 25 to 100 micron sections of the blade. Look at that for subsequent histo chemical processing. And you can put this one into usually PBS, buffer in solution. And other type is a section paraffin embedded, which can go down to several micron level. Uh, but one example I have to say, hey, my tissue has GFP. I want to see it. Now, which one to use? This one preserved your GFP protein molecule, but this one by using paraffin, you know, it heats up down, cross link everything. You may not be able to see those uh, GFP protein left with a paraffin embedding. So that's another aspect you have to understand. So cryostat microtome, I want to show you that inside the chamber. Cryostat has a microtome inside, but just inside, all these are in minus 20 degree, okay? But inside you can have this uh, microtome. You see this white, this one's are OCT and uh, this whole thing is a blade which cut. So cryostat can be explained as a microtome enclosed in a refrigerated cabin, right? And especially you make a frozen section, a cut on a cryostat for histology. Then what do we mean by frozen section? A rapid microscopic analysis of a specimen, and this is fresh, unfixed tissue. Okay, so the tissue is snap frozen. Snap frozen, I mean, like very quick freezing. For example, even sometimes use uh, dry, dry ice 
or liquid nitrogen to quick freezing the tissue. And the water inside tissue, which is of course the most majority of component, becomes an ice. So the tissue becomes, you know, icy form, and the water is an embedding media for the tissue, right? So what are the pros and cons for this approach? We can do quick diagnosis with this, and it's all, it's all fine for immunohistochemistry. IF, I'll tell, tell you again, immunofluorescence, ISH, I'll tell you again later, in situ hybridization. Don't worry if you don't know about this one, it, it's coming later. And, but by making this, the morphology can be distorted because we didn't do proper fixation, okay? So for example, when you freeze, there are ice crystal artifacts can form. So even the same, let's say HM stain, you will see an ugly or sometimes very strange artifacts or like holes in, in the tissue of HM stain. That's because of this crystal ice artifact. So that's freezing artifact. But you know, if you know it clearly, that's fine. Um, so freezing artifacts can be there, but you can gain something such as you can keep the DNA, RNA, and protein, you know, you can keep those. So I want to talk about uh, next as a fiber tone section. The machine looks like this. Uh, we have this one in our department, okay? And how does it do? As I say, fiber tone is vibrating this laterally while the, the blade is moving forward and backwards so that we can cut the sample. Okay. Of course, these samples are always in iced, uh, ice cold PBS uh, or ACSF media, right? And there are different types. For those who will be actually doing this experiment, you should consider conventional one. And this is another type called the compressor tone. This uses the agarose gel as an embedding media um, for compared to this. All right, so this vibrant palm has a vibrating razor blade. You know, it looks almost the same as our razor blade. To cut, uh, let me see, changing. Cut through. Frozen or unfrozen? Un unfrozen. Yes, that's what vibratone is about. Useful for avoiding artifacts, changes in morphology, or interruption of biochemical activities caused by uh, changing again. Where does she go? <laughs> Freezing. Yes, because we don't freeze. That's the key. We want to keep it alive. But there are many parameters we have to uh, tune. So I'm not telling this is easy. There are protocols you have to figure out, optimize the amplitude, the speed, and the angle of the blade. These are all containing into mechanical aspect uh, because the brain is so soft. So it can be cut into 100 to um, about like 400 sec micron sections. Okay. You can cut even thicker, but there, there will be a problem later on. Also necessary for brain slice experiments, where slice must be kept alive. Uh, in tissue culture or our electrophysiology study, which is actually, we, we need a live brain. All right, so the next is a, a rather new, so I want to talk about this clarity. Uh, here are the acronyms, which nobody will remember, but once you read it, that's good. Clear lipid exchange, the acrylamide hybridized rigid imaging, okay? Um, so you see the term lipid. And immunostaining in situ hybridization compatible tissue hydrogen. You see this hydrogen. Okay, so what are this uh, clarity is about? You, everyone know this contact lens. You know, most contact lens are made of hydrogen, okay? So, but contact lens is very transparent. The idea of why our brain is so opaque, especially the white matter is more opaque. And the key idea is, hey, when light goes, light will scatter. 
and the major scatterer in the brain, you realize is a lipid, especially you know the myelin sheet, the lipid. So how about you know removing the lipid while preserving all the uh, cellular components there? That's the key. So hydrogen monomer. So replacing the lipids and all the the inside with the hydrogen makes brain as transparent. Okay. So this lipid layer, uh, hydrogen monomer infusion, and step two, you you actually hydrogenize. So connect and stabilize with the hydrogen to the tissue. And then you suck out all this lipid by electrophoretic tissue clearing. So electrophoresis is a biology, molecular biology technique by using electric field for you know, moving these uh, polar molecules uh, with a charge, charged molecules with SCBS. It's like a soap like one. So you can take out, so these tissue shapes are preserved, but you see these lipid bilayers are gone while all these proteins are in place so that you can make the brain as a clear like this. All right, so this is a great, uh, a new approach, and so that's why it was a Nature article in 2013. It became a sensation in, in many of the field. So fixes tissue using a, as I said, hydrogel to preserve the physical structure of proteins and nucleic acids, okay, such as DNA, RNA, while removing light scattering. You see, we remove lipids so that reduce dramatically the light scattering. So make the tissue transparent for structural visualization without need to section the tissue. That's why we section the tissue because we cannot see with the light microscope more than like one millimeter thickness or several hundred millimeters still, it's very hard to observe. So this technology actually revolutionized it. So I, I put a, a good example, like this is a whole brain uh, which is transparent. You can see the whole connection. That is great. Uh, so even this one is a, a study. Uh, you can do some of this study. Let's say cocaine and fear circuit uh, with an addiction and terror are modeled, and then you want to see what's happening uh, in, in the brain. So it came actually in New York Times. Brain is a clear jello for scientists to explore. And there are like 3D uh, movies. You can go there and. Take a, now I think it's a very popular, you can find it. All right, so now let's change our gears uh, a little bit to uh, visualizing morphology. Now we fix it, this uh, tissue. Now how to enhance contrast visualization of structure? You know, water is uh, uh, more than three quarters of the brain, a lipid, protein, carbohydrates, and other organic molecules they provide structure and durability of the nervous system. And however, in terms of those structures, you know, you watch the cells in in vitro, cells you cannot see very well. And even the fibers, individual fibers are mostly transparent. And that, what that means is it's difficult to see, difficult to get the contrast. So you need to enhance the contrast with various dyes. So there come a staining to see which part you are interested. So for example, you want a cell body stain, there are fiber trap stain, there are gold stain, and even intracellular and juxtacellular labeling for the specific cell of what you actually just measured with the electrophysiology. Okay, so better to see rather than here. So HME stain look like this. Uh, hemotoxin and then eosin. So you see, I think this is uh, maybe a tumor forming inside the brain. And he's talking about histo hist <clears throat> in history, Golgi staining actually gave an excellent view of neurons or details of dendritism. And the reason why this, you can see, it's, it's just awesome. If you look at it with your eye, um, the trick is it only stains sparsely later. In fact, the real neurons are more packed, so you cannot see very well. So it was very lucky that Golgi stain only uh, stained somehow only a number of neurons. Okay, and then Nissel stain, 
uh, for typically for neuronal cell body and myelin stain for this axonal tract. You see a, a marked uh, one here. This is actually corpus callosum, which connects left and right hemisphere of the brain. So this is a like highway. So you can see a lot of a strong myelin staining over here. Also these tracts are stained, okay? All right, so let's go one by one. Cell body stain. Uh, cell body by basophilic stain to visualize cell body. Uh, Basal means basic, philic, loving. And this is good for staining acids, okay? So acids such as DNA acid, RNA acid, nucleic acid, cell nucleus, and ribosome. So HNE, literally hematoxylin and enzyme. So H comes first, which is good for nuclear and that blue color. And second is a protein or, or cytoplasm protein, and that's a pink, okay? So this is like most of the pathologists that use. Uh, but in neuroscience, uh, we have to use a lot of other called a missile stain. There's a note E, okay? So this labels, let's say, um, Goyunhe, can you guess what are we gonna stain with the missile, with the cell? We actually have to contrast ribosomes and rough ER, which are enriched in the run. Can you guess? RNA. Excellent. Yeah, it's not DNA, but it's RNA, okay? And we use uh, some kind of uh, dye agent, Cressylid, uh, Cressylid violet to reveal physiological state of some neuron. So why, you know, why we are using the missile stain to stain RNA and talk about neuron and glia because neuron has a lot of active protein synthesis. You know, neurons spend a lot of energy inside our body. So it keeps doing something and that, that's why we use even label RNA and we actually see most of neuron and even sometimes glia as well. And the last one, you know, these are like very strange or foreign states uh, names, but I want you to listen once because you will be seeing this over and over. So-called Dapi stain, okay, for nucleus. This is the name, host stain. You can use it for even a live cell. And propidium iodine called PI, this is a red stain for nucleus. So this is now we are talking fluorescent markers and fluorescent microscopy. And that dye stains uh, nucleic acid. How? They intercalate DNA within the helical spirals of iolate called the answer, DNA in the cell nucleus, so that we can see the nucleus of chromosome. So that darky and hosts are emitting blue fluorescence. Then you know the stop shift and the fluorescence. To get the blue light, you need to shine lower region, such as UV light. Propidium iodine is a little different because they emit red fluorescence by excitation of, yes, green light. Green light. Exactly. Good. So, yeah, that's the difference. But I want to remind you one thing about propidium iodine because this one has another use. Uh, it assays cell death as it's membrane impermeable. Okay. So, you remember the, the cell death? the membrane becomes permeable, that propidium iodine gets into the cell and it, it generates a red fluorescence for dead cell, not the healthy cell. So this would be a great assay for when you are judging, hey, I give this treatment, I want to see whether there are uh, the cell death comparison. Let's say inside the brain, some part or brain tumor, you give a drug treatment, you want to see how effective the brain killing those tumor cells in the brain. Propidium iodine would be a great way for using fluorescence assay. All right, now let's talk about fiber, especially for myelin, which uh, we label white metal tract by staining myelin. So what is myelin? Myelin is made by, in CNS, oligodendrocyte. A lot of these, uh, myelin seeds are actually cell surface. So that has a lipid of bilayers. So there's a lot of lipid. That fatty substance, which is an insulator 
for electrical resistance of axonal you know, electrical transmission. So the protocol by reader or wire methods to stay myelin, dark or black. And I'm gonna show you it's a lipophilic fluorescence thing. Why? We are talking about a lot of liquids. Okay, and that's major also light spectrum. Uh, so I want to show this. You see these stains are fiber thing, which is using lipophilic fluorescence thing. Let's go uh, to the past Golgi stain. Uh, silver stain technique by Camillo Golgi, who got Nobel Prize by finding this and utilizing it. And better to see the Golgi stain again. And this is like 3D. This looks excellent with the, under the microscope. You will be very happy. I hope you have some chance to see this uh, it's in, in my office. A classical technique to completely label individual neuron and their processes. Once you label, it completely uh, labels the whole neuron, okay? So the good thing is neurons are labeled its entirety. But if you think about membrane stain for neuron specific, some or um, neuron cytoplasmic protein stain, sometimes you cannot see a dendrite because there's so small space compared to cell body. But this Golgi stain actually complete entire cell body processes or even dendritic spines, a tiny, tiny synapse junction on this. Okay, uh, the good thing is only five to 10% are available so that you can see this nice uh, detached uh, uh, shape. Otherwise it's impossible to see. Okay, lastly, intracellular and juxtacellular labeling. Um, how to label individual neuron during an experiment such as electrophysiology. So in practice, let's say you have a brain slice. You want to watch and measure, let's say, um, some extracellular electrophysiology, but of a specific neuron. You want to check that cells, uh, specifically the morphology and those later on. How can you do that? This is a question. Okay, so you can use glass pipette to feel a neuron of interest with a chemical that can later be visualized. You remember the uh, patch clamp technique using glass pipe and you touch or puncture a cell, and later you want to know the cell. One way is you fill the slide glass pipe with a fluorescent dye, inject it into that cell. Okay, then you can actually mark them. So you can use a biotin, very strong, uh, uh, um, strong combination later you can use a covalent bonding to actually visualize it, uh, biocytin and neurobiotin, and you can intracellular label cells in vivo or even in, uh, in slice and even in vivo. So I'm not saying it's easy, but this is possible. Especially more difficult, juxtacellular labeling. This is a little difficult terminology, but juxta means near to. What it means is you have this touching the cell of your interest, and you label that cell called juxtacellular label. So, uh, Ko yun again. So during on intra or extracellular recording, the electrode tip can be opposed. It touches to the neuron's membrane. Okay. And- Exactly, yes. Extracellular recording session, you, you touch, okay? And juxtacellular labeling can completely feel the neurons, dendrite, or axonal arborizations, okay? And I just put a diagram here. Arborization is the action branches out. So that arborization, a fine branching structure, you can even see this fine arborization by use of juxtacellular labeling. Okay, so this is the end. I think I have a little spend time. So I'll give you three minutes of Q&A and uh, those who write Q&A can leave and the two students can remain so we can actually use a chatting for setting up the, the time for question, Q&A session preparation. All right, thank you everyone for your attention. We have a lot to cover. So I know it's a, it's a lot to cover, but uh, Wednesday, there's 